Hey everyone, lately I've been spending a little bit of time on websites like HackerRank and Codility. Uh, they're websites that present you with programming challenges and ask you to solve them uh, in a certain amount of time. Um, they're kind of fun to do. They really challenge your, uh, your thinking as a programmer, your ability to problem solve. Um, they're, they're more fun, especially if you write them off the top of your head. It would be very easy to go on Google and to search for the problem and find the solution and to look up algorithms and things of that sort. Uh, I find it quite fun to just read the problem and try and tackle it with to the best of my abilities. And that's what I've done. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to go over the solutions uh, that I came up with on the fly in various problems. We're going to do one at a time per video. But today I'll start off with one called binary gap. And it's uh, from the Codility website. So let's take a look at the problem. So binary gap is essentially a problem uh, that is asking us to look at a positive integer and to break it down into its binary representation and then count the zeros that are between any set of ones in, in that binary number. So uh, as you can see, for example, in this number here, we have uh, three zeros here and four zeros here. So what they want us to do is because these zeros are between ones, uh, they're kind of sandwiched inside of them, then these are binary gaps. That's what they're referring to. So what they want us to do is to count those and to return the largest one that we find within a binary number. So for example, here we would return two, here we would count three and then four, so we would return four. Um, here we would return zero because these zeros are not sandwiched between a pair of ones. Uh, and here we would return five. So I think that's pretty straightforward pretty easy. The assumption section here tells us that, you know, we can assume that n is an integer uh, in the range of one to, you know, whatever that is, two billion, something, something. So what we have to do is find a way to take the number that's passed into the function and uh, break it into its, like I said, into its binary representation and then uh, analyze it and return the binary gap. So what they're asking us to write is a function called solution that takes an integer and returns an integer. And then what Codility does is it calls this function with a bunch of different integers, passes them in, and then it checks the output of my function. And that's how it checks for correctness. Uh, in this case, it doesn't check for performance, but some are actually graded on performance. Uh, but in this case, they, they haven't tested it, though I'm pretty sure that this would perform quite well. Um, now, there's, of course, optimizations that can be done on this. Um, we could always improve our code, but my goal always when doing things like this or any programming for that matter, very rarely I, I don't do this, but um, I always try to write my solution correctly first. And then you, uh, with regard to optimization, you always want to then measure and see where you're actually in need of optimization and then focus on those bits and uh, or those pieces not to confuse you with bits since we're going to be talking about bits but then to focus on those pieces and then optimize measure and optimize always it's important to do that but always get it correct first so that you know that what you're doing is correct and then you could actually have a baseline to start from when you start optimizing so that being said let's take a look at some of this code so the first thing i do here is i take uh, the size of n. So that tells me the size of this integer, how many bytes it's going to take up on my system. And then I multiply that by eight, which tells me uh, the number of bytes times eight, there's eight bits in a byte, that this tells me how many bits this integer is going to take up, which is going to tell me how many times I have to iterate over this integer in order to take a look at each bit. Because what we're doing is we're starting at the least significant bit, and we're checking each one and checking if it's true or false, one or zero, set or not set. Those are the terms used when, when discussing this. And uh, if we find a set bit, then we start counting zeros. Then if we find an unset bit, we count those zeros. And then that's how we know um, where a one, like a gap starts and ends. And then we can keep track of those uh, gap sizes. So the first thing, like I said, is to figure out how many bits. Then we have some variables that we're going to be using. This one is going to tell us whether we should count zeros or not. This is used so that, you know, if you remember, there's this number here. We don't want to count these zeros because we haven't found a one in the beginning here. So we want to essentially ignore those. Uh, and it, obviously, with this number, we're not going to count any zeros, period. Um, but this is why this variable is here. It's so that 
and it's initialized to false. So we don't start counting until we find our first one. So um, here we have a for loop. It's going to loop over all of the bits. We've already I've already explained what num bits is. So it's going to loop 32 times essentially on a, on a machine where an integer is 32 bits, for, for example. Uh, and then it's going to then we're going to do this. This is sort of the most important bit from this entire exercise. Uh, and I'll explain that. So let's use a small integer for as an example. If they passed in 11, let's say n equals 11 in binary, that translates to um, 0, 1 or what was it? 1, 0, 1, 1. That's what it is. Um, and the way that works, uh, I'll explain quickly, is if you remember uh, your binary, it's 1, 2, 4, 8. And you, own, and you sum up all of the ones that have a 1 that are set. So 8 plus 2 plus 1 is 11. If you don't know binary, I do recommend knowing binary and hex and knowing how to read those and convert them on the fly because you will run into these quite a bit in programming. Um, so let's let's go with this. So the first part of this is we're taking n and we're shifting it b times. So b goes from zero and it's going to loop until it, it, it hits 31. Uh, once it hits 32, actually, it's going to break out of the loop because we're saying less than 32 in this case. So if we take 1011 and we shift it, let's say zero, then we haven't shifted it at all. And then it remains 1011. Then if we take it again, and the next iteration, we shift it by one, it's going to be 0101. And then if we go again, and we shift it by two, then it's going to be 0010. And then, you know, so on and so forth. Let's shift it three times. Uh, it's going to be 001. 01. My bad. So you can you can see this shift happening. If you just look at this column alone, uh, we're essentially moving things to the right. It's a it's a right shift is what this is bitwise shift. And uh, then the digits on the right side essentially get dropped off, they kind of fall off there. And then on the left side where, uh, you know, where the digit was previously, it's it's padded with zeros, it's it's uh, that's how shifting works. And you can see that here, right, the 101 has now shifted over one position, this one has dropped off, and then there's now a zero in the place of where this one was. And then again, you can see that this one zero has shifted here. And in the end, that one has actually shifted to the end. The reason I'm doing that is because what I'm interested in, and in this test is the rightmost, like I said, the least significant digit number, uh, or bit, sorry, is the better way to put that in this binary number. So what we're doing is we're starting off and looking at the first least significant bit here, and that's a one. And, and then we're doing an uh, what, what's called a bitwise and this is not a Boolean and um, it's not the way you uh, the way you do and in, in an if statement where you say, uh, I want this and that to be true in order to enter this code block. This is taking an integer. So in this case, the integer after it's been shifted, right? And, and then doing an and on it. And I'll explain why that happens. So the reason why I do the end is because I want to isolate this bit here. So if we look at the value one in binary, and I'll write it out this way for simplicity, in a four bit world, which is not what we're dealing with, but, but I don't want to write all of the extra zeros and all the extra values here. But in a world where we have four bit integers, this is how you'd write a one. And the reason why we do this is because we know that all of these zeros, actually, I'll, I'll explain bitwise and operations first, any, any two bits ended together that are not like if, if both of them are not ones, you'll always have a false, you need a and b to be true in order for that to return true. If you have one and zero, that's false. They're not both true. If you have zero and zero, obviously that's false as well. It's only true if it's one and one. So we know that if we have these three zeros here, this will automatically turn these bits off. And then we're only going to be left with the the one here if it was a one indeed. So I'll explain how that works. So let's go from left to right just to keep it simple. So one and zero is zero. 0 and 0 is 0, 1 and 0 again is 0, 1 and 1 is 1. So now we know that in this first bit, we had a 1, right? We've isolated just this bit by turning off the, all of these other ones. And we know that there was a 1 here. 
if we if we do that again, we're going to end up with uh, for the second bit, we're going to end up with the same result. So we're going to have 0, 0, 0, 1. That's because 0 and 0 is uh, 0, 1 and 0, and then 0 and 0 obviously turn off. And then 1 and 1 gives us a 1. And again, let's do it here. 0, 0, 0, right? 1. Actually, I'm doing it in the wrong column. Uh, 0 and 0, 0 and 0, 1 and 0, all zeros. Again, I'm just reiterating. But now, in the least significant bit, we have a 0 on this side. And when we end it, we know that we have a zero. So this will give us a bunch of zeros. And then again, here we'll have um, zero, 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 one. So what this results in, this operation here, is actually an integer. And that integer is a zero or a one or true, true, false, true, right? because that's what this if is looking for. It's looking for a Boolean expression. And because one in programming is true and zero is false, uh, or any non-zero value in, in most programming languages is true and then zero is false, then we know that this expression will be true if we had a, a one in, in the least significant bit and a zero in uh, or, or false if it was a zero. And this is what we're doing here. So I'll go back to the shifting. So what, what's actually happening is we're starting off, we're looking at the first bit, we're checking if it's true or false, then we go and we shift everything to the right. So now what was in the second bit is now in the first bit, and then we, we actually check that bit and we see if it was true or false. Then we shift everything over again, and now this third bit is now in here, and then we test that bit and we see if it was true or false, and so on and so forth until we reach the end of this integer. And, and essentially, that is what this right shifting does. You can think of it almost like an assembly line shifting, and we're checking each thing, we're checking each bit uh, by shifting everything over by one, and then on the right side, the digits that we've already checked kind of drop off, but we're, uh, that's how we're shifting the entire number over so we can analyze each bit and do something with that. So what's happening is we, uh, let's, let's step through this simple number here now. Okay, so we're looping over, we shift zero times the first iteration because we want to actually check the first bit. And uh, if it's a one, which it will be in this case, we say, OK, we found a one. Let's start counting zeros now. Then if gap length is greater than biggest gap, which are both initialized to zero, we do uh, we, we set gap length into uh, or we set biggest gap based on what gap length is. But in this first pass, obviously, they're both zero. So we don't do this. And we just reset gap length to zero here. Uh, this happens every time we find a one. And it should happen. Uh, it might seem a little redundant, but it doesn't really affect uh, affect much at all. Uh, then we go to the next bit. So now we shift it over by one, we check that bit, it's true. Um, we come back in here. Obviously, this is when when we find a one, we set this again to one. Um, again, that's a little redundant, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and then here we check if gap length is greater. Again, none of them have changed because we just had a one and then immediately again another one. And then we do this again, and then we move over to the next bit. Now, in this case, we're checking the zero that was originally here. And if we find a zero, right, and we're, we've found a one already, that means we're counting the zeros. Um, we increment gap length by one. So now gap length is equal to one. Then we go to this last bit here, and then we know when we check it that it's going to result in true. We go back here. And now gap length is a value of one. And it's obviously greater than biggest gap, which is currently sitting at zero. And then we set biggest gap, uh, gap to the value of, uh, of one, which is what our gap length is currently sitting at. And then we reset gap length back to zero. The reason why we want to do this every time we find a one is because we want to reset our count of, uh, of the gap length in case we have numbers like this, right? Like in this number, we're gonna start here. We're gonna start counting zeros because we hit a one. Then we're gonna count one, two, three zeros. And then we want to jot down how long that gap length was and then um, keep track of it inside biggest, uh, biggest gap, which is now gonna equal to three. But then once we go back and we hit that next one, what we want to do is we want to reset gap length and start counting this next gap from scratch. 
We don't want to start counting one, two, three, and then continue counting four, five, you know, etc. We we want to reset, and then we want to see if this gap is greater than this gap. And we're gonna now obviously count five here. And when we do say so, once we get to the end of that gap, once we find this last one here, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get back in here. And then we're going to check if gap length, which is going to equal to five in the, at that point, is greater than the last one we recorded, which was three. And then we're going to keep track of that one. That one. And then since we're going to be at, at the last bit here, uh, the last bit that we're at least able to do anything with, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to eventually break out of this loop. Now, these numbers, by the way, and this is a point that can be optimized, you know, in a let's say a 64 bit integer on a, on a 64 bit system, we you know all, all we need to do is check this number right like you don't need all 64 bits to be checked if we know that the number is 1041 well you only need this many bits to represent that number so why go and loop 64 times when you only need these ones here right like if they pass in uh, a nine well do we really need to loop 64 times uh, you don't what you can do is check how many bits are required to uh, to represent the number nine and only loop that many times. That's something that can be an optimization uh, potentially. But uh, for the sake of simplicity, just to understand really at, at, it, at its core what the solution is doing, I'm not doing that. Uh, but that could be an exercise for you. So anyways, um, essentially what, what we've done is once we get to the end of the integer, let's just say this one, uh, eventually, we're going to break out of this loop because we're actually going to be going over a bunch of zeros here. So nothing's going to happen. We're going to hit this one. We're going to hit this if condition and we're going to record the biggest gap. In this case, it's going to be five. Uh, it's going to overwrite the previous three. And then eventually we're going to, you know, we're going to hit a bunch of zeros and then we're going to get to this line here and we're going to return five. And that's how we find the biggest gap. So I hope that was clear. Um, I know that there's probably clever, better ways to do this. Uh, I'd really like to know how you would solve this problem, whether you just solved it off the, off the top of your head uh, and came up with something really cool and clever, something that's more performant. There's certain things I don't like here, like the redundancy of sen setting this to zero every time or setting this flag over and over. Uh, but I, I don't let that bother me because it is correct. And uh, this is what I came up with um, off the top of my head while being tested and timed. So. Um, like I said, it's important to make sure that it's correct at first. And then if I wanted to redo this in a way where uh, I've optimized it or removed some of the redundant instructions that are happening in here, then I'll do a video on that as well and show you how I can optimize that just so that we can see the contrast between the two. And maybe even I'll do a, a, a performance analysis to see what these little things actually do to an algorithm. But uh, in any case, I hope that was interesting. I hope you get something out of this video. And uh, like I said, if you do solve this problem, it's available on the Codility website. Uh, please leave me a comment. Let me know what your suggestions are, how you solved it. Uh, I'd really like to know. Um, thank you.